uh, uh, we are uh, we are live, uh, Sundar and Malvika. Uh, hi, friends. Uh, uh, welcome back to the webinar series of Career360. My name is Maheshwar Peri. I'm the founder of Career360 and, and the editor also. Uh, today, what we have is, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the last decade, uh, the kind of quality of universities that have come, uh, which have started challenging the status quo in terms of the quality of uh, uh, out, uh, learning outcomes they promise and deliver, and also getting away from the STEM universities that you had. You know, we started with BITS and, uh, you know, IITs and IIMs and so on and so forth. But getting away from the STEM universities to start creating and uh, uh, sciences as, as courses, it's been a revolution of sort. Because you look at the kind of universities that came uh, right from Ashoka, uh, Jindal, Flame, uh, Kriya now. And the people backing these universities tells it its own story, uh, that there is a lot of conviction about the people who started creating these universities, investing these universities, and having an arm's length distance while ensuring that the universities prosper and uh, you know, uh, uh, deliver to what the, uh, its original promise is. So I thought that it is very important for us to have one conversation with possibly two of the best liberal arts universities that you have in the country, uh, two of the three, four, five that you uh, actually have been created, like Jindal being one, Flame being one. And one. So I, I thought we should have uh, uh, the vice chancellors of two universities, Kriya and uh, 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 Ashoka University, to come and address the issue of what liberal arts universities mean, what kind of courses they do offer, how are they different from STEM universities, how do they, what do they offer in sciences, which is not something similar to what STEM universities offer, and the placement prospects, learning outcomes, and the actual outcome in itself. So, uh, which is the reason why I actually uh, brought both Kriya and uh, Ashoka together. Uh, uh, the people that we have the, uh, are the vice chancellors of both the universities. Uh, Professor Malibika Sarkar is a vice chancellor of Ashoka University and professor of English. The National Sciences Program of, at Ashoka was initiated by her and she led a distinguished group of science advisors in envisioning this program and overseeing the recruitment. Before coming to Ashoka, she was first vice chancellor of Presidency University. In fact, she saw through the college becoming a university in itself. And then she was earlier the head of department uh, of English at Jadavpur University. She's very deeply interested in women's welfare and the education of underprivileged children. She is currently the president of the Women's Coordinating Council, founded in 1960, the apex body of the state of West Bengal with 74 affiliated NGOs. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other gentleman that we have is uh, uh, Dr. Sundar Ramaswamy, who is currently the vice chancellor of uh, Kriya University. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy is on leave from Middlebury College, one of the top nationally ranked liberal arts colleges of the US where he is distinguished college professor of international economics. He was the officiating director and visiting distinguished professor at the Madras School of Economics. From Jan 2009 till Jan 2015, he served as the president and, uh, and Frederick C. Dirks professor of international economics at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, a graduate school at Middlesbury College in Monterey, California, USA. Welcome, Dr. Ramaswamy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the first question I will, uh, you know, ask both of you is: I think both the universities, unlike many universities in India, have been have started uh, 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 looking at this entire uh, uh, creating of the the creation of the university itself was different. Can you, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ramasamy, uh, begin with what is the uh, idea behind uh, Kriya and how it came together to what it is today? Thank you, Perry. And uh, it's nice to be on this panel with uh, Dr. Sarkar. And Ashoka has, of course, led the way in many ways in India. Uh, so the idea for Kriya came a few years back when uh, a few of us industrialists, uh, academics, I was on a sabbatical, and we wanted to do something in the space of education. Uh, India being such a vast country, and I'm a product of Delhi University, and the system in some ways has not changed in the time when I went as an undergraduate and this idea of having a freedom of choice, which is really what is at the foundation of uh, uh, the undergraduate study at Korea. And, you know, the idea was to create a program of study that students, when they come out of high school, are not blocked into an economics major or a physics major. Because when you look at the world's problems, uh, world's problems require solutions that require multiple perspectives. And this idea that we are siloing people very early on, uh, I've always sort of rebelled against it. And to have a system that allows choice of study 
So at places like Kriya, the first year students take uh, courses across a whole range of core and skills, everything from scientific reasoning to mathematics to history to ethics. And, and then you can have time to decide what is it that I want to specialize in? What is it that I want to major in, right? Unlike uh, when I went to college, it was I had to be a major uh, at the time I walked into my alma mater. And so, and I, and I think the system has not changed in India for so long. And so this idea of creating choice, uh, and it sort of has to be guided so that students are mentored with their advisors to think about what their interests are, because at 17 and 18, as the brain still evolving, students' interests keep changing. And so to create a system of education that allows you to explore the curriculum before you decide what is it that I'm really good at. And actually what you'll find students are good at multiple things. So why is it that we only have to specialize in one thing called a major? So you can have a double major, you can have a joint major, you can have a major and a minor. You can have multiple ways to express your strengths and interests. And I think that is the route at which a system like CREA was set up. Okay. And uh, can you uh, briefly tell us about the kind of people who came to back CREA? So, you know, the, uh, uh, in, in some ways we benefited by a uh, sort of combination of what I would call the old economy and the new economy. Uh, you had uh, the sponsoring body was uh, IFMR, which was the Institute for Financial Management Research set up in 1970. Uh, the chairman of that was Mr. Vagul, one of the foremost bankers of India. Uh, in fact, Moore was very involved with that, isn't it, sir? Yeah, he was Nachiket with, was with IFMR. That's and so he's the first right. chancellor of Korea. And of course, the other right. noted academics like Raghuram Rajan and uh, uh, John Etchemendi and Manjul Bhargav and, you know, in different disciplines, Srinath Raghavan, who also teaches at Ashoka. And we had a sort of a yeah. set, set of people who came together. The current chairman of the board is Mr. Sesha Sai, who's of course been both at Infosys and Ashok Leland. And the person who Uh, uh, Dr. Sundar, you're breaking. Uh, uh, I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, now. This idea of creating yeah. diversity. And so he all brought right. us all together. So as I said, it's a combination of new and old in terms yeah. of coming together of professionals, academics, industrialists, and now the governing council has got some of the stalwarts of Indian industry, whether it's Mr. Anand Mahindra, Sajjan Jindal, Anuaga, uh, Mr. Ramadurai, and so on. Um, and I think it's a unique, unique people like that who have a vision uh, to back an entity like Korea, because I hope we are around for a long time and not just for the next five, 10 years. I think we need to have a horizon for the next 50 to 100 to 150 years. And these are just the seeds we are planting right now. No, I always also wish sir, that, you know, liberal arts universities prosper in this country because we've done enough of STEM and I think we need STEM, but uh, what we missed out uh, as a nation is liberal arts uh, uh, universities. And so I wish all of you well. Uh, uh, Malvika, can you explain and elaborate of how Ashoka as an idea started and where it is today? So the, it, it is great to see that we actually have a lot of similarities with uh, what drives Kriya. But of course, Ashoka began as a university in 2014. It began thinking about this earlier because in 2011, it started its flagship program called the Young India Fellowship. And that was a program designed to create leadership material. It, is a, a, it still continues as a one-year fellowship program where people from different disciplines come together and they uh, have the experience of being taught by some of the best people around the world because we have faculty from India as well as faculty who visit us every year from other uh, countries of the world. So the best of teaching in a variety of subjects two people who have come together from different branches. These are all postgraduate students doing a one-year program. That's a flagship program that was first thought of in 2011. And then as uh, planning went on amongst the founders, they decided to have a full-fledged university. That came into being in 2014. And when that came together, you know, the idea of leadership that was inculcated in the Young India Fellowship continues, but it now has a much wider dimension because it's leadership in a variety of ways, including you know, uh, in the creation of knowledge. So both in, in terms of giving back to society, but also in knowledge creation. So there's a range of ideas now opening up. And of course, the great thing about any university 
is that it's always growing and, and evolving. That's the excitement of being a university, that uh, not you know, even those that are 800 years old in other parts of the world, they are, too are still evolving. That's what makes a university exciting. Yeah. But Ashoka, again, began by thinking that it should give our young people in India an opportunity to think for themselves, to decide for themselves. So in the first instance, all our undergraduates do a set of nine foundation courses where they are exposed to various disciplines. They have foundational ideas that they imbibe. They also have the experience of doing science, literature, history, uh, you know, a whole range of things. And then they go on to decide in what should they major. Okay. So this idea of laying the foundations of thought for you know afresh for these young minds because university is all about being an enabler in getting the best of the potential of the young students who come to us you know uh, getting that to blossom so the foundation courses offers that opportunity for them to think decide and then take their various pathways and they can then uh, continue to do a major or a major and a minor, or major, minor, and concentration. They can uh, then, uh, after the three years, go into the fourth year, where they can explore other avenues, or if they so wish, concentrate on their chosen field. If they feel that here is where I will make my contribution in life, then they continue into the fourth year as an economics major, or a physics major, or an English major, into the fourth, fourth year. Um, of, the, of what we call the ASP. So it is this range and flexibility that ensures both you know, uh, depth as well as a wide spectrum. That is what uh, drives university like Ashoka. And because I come from another university, which is in fact, um, if you look back in history, it is the oldest in India. Uh, presidency as Hindu college was set up in 1817. And so I've seen uh, how those universities function and they are great too. But I see the immense possibilities that the new universities are offering. And this to me is the order of the day. This is how India is going to progress. So I think it, these are exciting times to be uh, uh, in this space, in the space that you have created for yourself, which always existed, but it's just that no one uh, latched onto it the way uh, Ashoka has has uh, you know uh, uh, taken the lead, ma'am. Uh, do you think the Young India Fellowship gave you uh, a, a springboard based on which you can actually jump on to the uh, creating a liberal arts university? The Young India Fellowship uh, was an experiment, yeah. but it proved very successful because you know it we could take away many lessons from it, including the fact that young people are very open to different kinds of experiences. So um, I know of, so of someone who was a mechanical engineer who joined the Young India Fellowship. I know because I taught him, I took classes. He has since gone on to write you know, um, uh, film scripts. So he's changed direction altogether. That was his calling, but he never discovered it because he went into engineering straight away. So these kinds of opening up of possibilities it showed us that given the opportunities, a young mind will be enabled to reach out to those possibilities. And so that was a learning experience. And that, well, of course, the thought of a liberal arts university was there, but that got reinforced by the experience of the Young India Fellowship. Dr. Ramsamy, this is for you. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, the new universities have giving fantastic uh, you know, teaching and learning outcomes. Uh, but the affordability has been a, qu a question mark, right? Especially for a country like India. And I saw in both your uh, you know, uh, platforms that you know, uh, on your portals that you are need blind to a meritorious student. A, a student who deserves to be a part of your university would be a part of your university and you will find ways of ensuring that he becomes a part of your uh, family. Can you please explain the affordability and how you're tackling uh, that part of the issue? So that's a very good question and a very important question in any country, but certainly in a country like India, right? Um, I think uh, we very early on decided uh, 
uh, Perry, that uh, we wanted to attract high potential students, not necessarily high performing students, because we all know if you just have a bad two weeks during the board exams, you know, your life changes, whereas potential is a lot more. Mm -hmm. So we have a very, very elaborate way in which we choose how we admit students. But we also recognize potential can come from, you know, it doesn't matter what board the students studied. It could be a state board, it could be a CBSC, it could be an IB school, it could be an international school. So our entering cohort, for instance, uh, this first year cohort, which is about 113 students, we wanted to be around 110 to 120, and we settled on about 113. About 20% of them are on full financial assistance, which means tuition and uh, living expenses also. But the way the admissions is done uh, is that admissions, uh, the admissions team admits the students based on uh, a whole host of criteria, which looks at everything from 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade marks to how they did in the immersion case to how they did on a quantitative exam to the interview. All of this gets collated and the, the sort of the list is drawn up. And, and then the student can meet with the financial assistance people to talk about uh, whether they can afford to come to Korea. And part of our fundraising is to essentially raise money for financial assistance. Uh, so we have scholarship money that we then can reward to students who are able to clear the admissions uh, without uh, necessarily worrying about whether they can pay. And we lay it all out on the website because we want to attract people whose parental income is less than five lakhs, parental income is between five and 10 lakhs, and then between 10 and 25, and then 25 and 50. And then of course there are full pay students whose parental income is over 50 lakhs. And so it is very heartening to see uh, very high potential students. I think 10% of the class this year are first generation college kids, meaning their parents never went to college, but they got an opportunity in a Korea kind of system. They made it, they were able to withstand and hold the competition from all the elite schools and elite cities and still manage to come through, which I think makes for a really, really robust and a very diverse classroom environment which of course then the faculty are excited about because they are able to make a contribution back to what Korea wants to do with regard to nation building in a sense. No, I'll persist with this question a bit more, Dr. Ramasamy. Uh, 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 I, at some time back, I actually had an argument or a debate or whatever it is, yeah. a conversation with uh, a reputed B school. Uh, and I told him that, you know, listen, if you charge 20 lakh rupees per annum or whatever it is, right. You end up making it a ghetto in a sense that you know you don't have and and you use the word diversity, which is what I keep talking yeah. about. If you want to create leaders, you need to have all kinds of people coming and sitting together under the class. Correct. And uh, the learning happens because of diversity as much as because of the teachers that are, that, that are there out there. Absolutely. Yeah. I came from a government college, and my belief in education is more because I've seen people giving up giving up everything so that they get educated. They won't go back right. home if it's a one week holiday because they can't afford the bus fare. So, yes. And that is what is a country. So how do you ensure that the diversity is as diverse as it should be for a country like India? Because 10% is a good number to begin with, but at some right. point in time, you need to scale that up, isn't it? Yeah. So I think, I think, the, I think you have, that's a, that it's very important that the, uh, that the founders and the people backing the university believe in the score principle and mission. And we try and continue to uh, sort of aspire to maintain that number, whether it can be an increased number or it's some number so that you do have a class that represents uh, what the diversity of India looks like. And you know, one can measure diversity in all sorts of criteria, whether it's regional, whether it's religious, whether it's class, caste, or thought, right? But you want to build a cohort. I think what makes interesting uh, the admissions process in a place like Korea is that you're not, admit while you're admitting a student, you're also admitting a cohort of a, or a class of students in terms of trying to build a class so that it does reflect what, when you step out onto the road, or when these students graduate and they step out into the real world, they, they actually look back on their three years at Korea or four years at Korea and say, I have actually interacted with people like this when I go and work in the workplace. And that is very important. So that diversity, because that is how uh, I think learning happens, because while I think a lot of learning happens uh, from professors, a lot of learning actually happens from their peers. So the peers are very diverse, but I think, implicit in your question, which I think is very important for all of us, it's not enough to just admit them, right? It's equally important as to what happens with the students when they are studying. 
In other words, what is the kind of support that we give so that the diversity is sort of enhanced and maintained and any problems that happen get addressed? Because we do have, and you know, India is like any other country, there's an enormous wealth gap. And you know, there are students who will not think anything about <coughs> dropping a thousand rupees on an afternoon uh, for entertainment, whereas others cannot even scrounge 50 rupees for something, right? So in order to make the students feel welcome, the experience for the student is equally important, not just having admitted them, but everything that we can do so that students also learn from each other. And I will tell you what's been the most heartening thing as a young vice chancellor of a young university is in the last six months to meet the students on the first day of orientation. And six months later to see that there is really, you can't make out Perry as to who's come from what background okay. because the confidence they carry in the classroom. So the discussions they have with me or the questions they raise to a speaker who's come to campus, I think it says a lot about the, what is happening in those six months, but also the faculty who have nurtured it, the support staff. So I think it's important when we talk about this issue of inclusivity, that it's not just done at the admissions and then dust our hands and say, okay, our job is done. It's, it's a continual process as to what we need to do with the students and how do we learn from it, correct certain mistakes and improve on it. And then actually have the students become agents of change. And that I think has been one of the most heartening is to realize students coming from backgrounds that they've never seen somebody else and then actually become friends with them and then realize that that's how governance and change happens on campus. That I think has been one of the most rewarding things for me in the last seven months. No, it's brilliant sir, what you're doing. Malvika, this question is for you. Um, you know, I, uh, when I was reading about you, you know, you're an English teacher and then you started a pure sciences, uh, you know, uh, course, you championed the thing at Ashoka. Uh, and which is what a liberal arts university is all about. It's not a STEM thing, but you still have pure sciences working out there. So can you, for the students and parents, because a lot of parents have this misgivings that a liberal arts university means it is arts. And arts has a particular definition in, in Indian context, right? So can you, for the parents out there, tell, tell them how their children are, and wards can pursue sciences while still being a part of a university like yourself or Korea or any other liberal arts First of all, I should like to tell them that uh, it's a misunderstanding of the term liberal arts yeah. because I can tell them that in that great scientific work by Copernicus on the revolution of the spheres, he talks about mathematics and astronomy as liberal arts. So as far back as that, 1543, you know, people were very conscious that liberal arts always included the sciences. And that, you know, historically, if you go back, and look at the great institutions of liberal arts across the world. It's always had sciences embedded. And it's just of late, because of this misunderstanding, we keep on saying liberal arts and sciences for Ashoka. But the term liberal arts itself actually encompasses the sciences also, the basic sciences, that is uh, the mathematical sciences, the natural sciences, unless those are enmeshed together with the humanities and the social sciences, you do not get a holistic university. So that for that holistic experience, you have to have all of this in place. You have to have economics, social sciences, humanities, and all of the sciences. And it is this conviction that, you know, I've always had. And so I was delighted when, uh, after I arrived at Ashoka, I was asked to start the sciences. And yeah. it was a very exciting time for me. And I'm very happy that, you know, science has really, really flourished at Ashoka. I think our biological sciences, our physics, mathematics, computer sciences, this year we are starting chemistry. And I won't disclose the name, but we have some outstanding people joining uh, our chemistry program to start the chemistry. So on the whole, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, computer science, and psychology. So all of this makes a very exciting component of science, but within a liberal arts university. Because as I said, you know, historically, liberal arts has always meant the arts and the sciences. And again, you know, liberal arts, that arts is not performing arts uh, or you know, um, painting, but arts as in the humanities and social sciences. So too, in its broader definition, historically, liberal arts have always included the sciences. And today, you know, Ashoka, I think, you know, 
it had been making its way to being the full circle. Now, with the introduction of the sciences, we are there. So now that holistic picture has emerged and Ashoka is what it is. And of course, I should say that the sciences have been such a runaway success at Ashoka. And we have really outstanding departments of biology and soon chemistry and so on. Can you also elaborate on the three plus one year programs, uh, uh, the three plus one year program that you have? Can you elaborate on that uh, for a moment? Sure. So uh, ideally, if we had a four year undergraduate uh, program, that would have been great because uh, in the first year, so much of a student's time goes on the foundation courses, which are absolutely essential, but that doesn't leave perhaps as much time for a great deal of depth into a chosen major. So what we therefore have is a three plus one year structure. At the end of three years, a student graduates with a BA or BAC degree in her or his chosen field, but then has the option of returning for a fourth year. And in the fourth year, there are two options the student can take. Either the student might wish to you know, do more work, specialize in her or his chosen field. So pick up more physics courses or uh, history courses, do a capstone thesis and do a great deal of intensive research and work in that. Or the student may wish to come back to complete the, the liberal arts experience. But this time in the fourth year, going in for a minor concentration, etc in a variety of other fields while doing some courses in the chosen major. So either a range or variety of subjects can be done in the fourth year, or it could be a focused, very research oriented work in the chosen field. And that creates the pathway for the student's life after university. Are they going into research, academics, or are they going into other kinds of fields? So that preparation time is there in the fourth year. That's when they decide which way are we going to go and they can uh, you know, make an informed choice at that point. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ranswami, this is for you. Uh, uh, in, at Korea, you actually have a BA and a BSc and it's pretty simple structure that many people in India would understand very clearly, right? Uh, so because this question requires uh, far too much explanation, I, I'll, I'm still persisting with this question that can you tell me how you know that you have the BA branch and BSc branch and within that you have pure sciences and basic sciences and here you have the other subjects. Can you slightly elaborate on the way you came up with that structure, sir? So, you know, when you, if you were to uh, look at the Kriya website, it starts from the way we think about our logo itself. You know, the idea of threads coming together in an interwoven way. And in fact, what I think we've been trying to push at Kriya is this thing called interwoven learning. And that requires, in some ways, I think the decision we made to not appoint faculty into departments, but to a faculty into divisions. Because like uh, Dr. Sarkar said, we also very strongly believe that, you know, the study of knowledge requires a student to be exposed to the humanities, literatures, arts, which is both performing arts, fine arts, sciences, and uh, social sciences. And that's exactly what happens. So in some ways, we decided very early on that all, all of these divisions and all of these disciplines will be offered for students as they will start specializing in their second and third year for majors or combinations of majors and minors, as I said in my introductory comments. And so the idea of weaving these things together and threading them in a way so that, for instance, you can mix and match and you can see certain concepts in different contexts is what gives rise to this concept of what we call interwoven learning. And so you can have a Bachelor of Arts, uh, which is traditionally what the UGC will say has been the discipline that will satisfy a BA honors, for instance, or you can have it in the science. But I would be less concerned about whether it's a BAC or a BA very, because I think the way this curriculum is designed, it allows you to uh, bring in elements that actually, for instance, you can bring in elements of humanities and literature, even as you're a scientist. So while you're getting a BSc in physics, 
you might actually bring in ethics, for instance, because that is one of those guiding principles on our website. We have eight or nine guiding principles that we want to weave throughout the curriculum. So while a student, in fact, this is the third trimester is going on right now and students are doing a course on ethical decision making. And oftentimes in many universities, you would have done it and I don't want it to be a checkbox. So I've done the requirement, now I can go on and do other things. We actually want students, if they do science or if they do politics or anything, to actually come back and wrestle with issues of ethics, for instance, while they're studying biology. Because if you're a biology student, uh, the notion of ethics in biology is quite different than the notion of ethics in, say, politics. So the reason we call this uh, interwoven is sort of think of a thread that you're weaving through a fabric or a tapestry. And so these six or seven elements, whether it's data, whether it's a sense of history, whether it's idea of doing research, whether it's a sense of ethics, get woven in, no matter whether you're a BSc honors or a BA honors, which then gives you a sense of bringing the curriculum together. So what you did in the first year, it just doesn't get forgotten in the first year because you bring it back in your second and third year but in a more specialized context, because then you're studying the discipline that you actually want to study it in great detail. But because the curriculum itself, the overarching layering is about bringing back certain uh, woven threads, uh, you go back and say, where do history of ideas come from? Why do I have to care about ethics if I'm a scientist? And you realize that you should care about ethics, whether you're a scientist or not, just because you're a student of philosophy that you should care about ethics. In fact, everyone should care about ethics. And so that is one of those things we said was a guiding principle that sort of brings back and forth. So while we have organized the curriculum in a BA honors and a BSc honors so that students have identifiable disciplines, I think what gives us a distinction is sort of this, what I would call the interwoven learning that sort of spreads throughout the three years and maybe into the fourth year when we launch it next year that they actually can begin to see uh, how certain ideas get introduced, reintroduced, affirmed, reaffirmed. So that sort of reinforces, why did they do certain things in their first year and they actually bring it back all the way till they finish, say, the capstone thesis in their third year. It's interesting you talked about the fourth year just now, sir, because yeah. I do remember in 2014 when this entire thing of UGC saying a graduation program can only be three years came in and uh, Many right. of us were upset, by the way. Uh, I, for one, was definitely upset. Uh, but universities didn't have a, chance, a choice but to, you know, follow the regulation. And right. then Ashoka came up with this 3 plus 1. Right. Is there some such thought process with you uh, which makes it a 3 plus 1 at some point? Yeah, so the fourth year has already been sort of approved and we will be launching it in uh, academic year 21-22. Um, or actually 22. So, you know, the current batch, when they come into the fourth year, will be a natural uh, feeder. But we actually want it to be open for anyone coming, even as a lateral admission from some other university, if they want to get the one-year career experience as a fourth year. So we have thought about both options. But obviously, we want to sort of launch it uh, either next year or the year after when our own uh, entering batch has finished their undergraduate and may be ready for a fourth year. And I think, uh, I think it's a great option because I think there is just such a volume of knowledge that also has to be studied. And then when you throw in internships and externships, there's a lot that can be done in a three plus one years uh, program uh, that I think, you know, oftentimes I think the fourth year allows um, students to both maybe specialize even beyond their undergraduate three-year bachelor's or maybe get more breadth if they want to, depending on as a, as a sort of a stepping stone to something either as a graduate school or maybe they want to think about careers, but they're not ready at the time they graduate from college. So the fourth year gives them a nice option to think about what the next step uh, holds for them once they finish their study at Korea. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Malvika, uh, the, this is for you. Uh, uh, I think Ashoka also spearheaded uh, the foreign collaborations uh, right from faculty exchange to student exchange and also were openly talking of how many students of theirs had joined at a post-graduation level in a foreign university. Can you explain to me now, because now study abroad is one of the things that has been hurt is what I understand, because students are this year at least are not likely to go out. Uh, and uh, even if they want to go out, in the, even if the universities want to take them, uh, those countries are closing the uh, borders, right? So there is a, a, a quite a bit, of, a bit of a volatility as far as study abroad for the current year is concerned. It may continue for some more time. So. Uh, a student who wants to still dream of studying outside of India, is there a twelve training program or a dual degree program or something like that, which gives him that pathway? 
At the moment, we do not have a program of the kind that you are asking about. But what we do have are a number of very strong international collaborations. And so now that it's become difficult for students to travel, to go to other universities outside the country, we are looking at ways of you know, bringing together this, uh, as it were, partnership that we have with all of these other universities, including Yale, Trinity College Dublin, and so on and so forth. So we have a dedicated uh, unit in the university that looks into foreign collaborations, student exchange, and all of that. And we are in conversation. And uh, if uh, we may not be able to give a joint degree, but we can certainly bring to our students who had aspirations of going outside of uh, India, the experience of now that we have all become so familiar with online classes, the experience yeah. of you know, um, uh, being there as a student in classes that we organize in collaboration with these partners. So at least that experience they can have as they wait for a time when the world opens out and they can travel again. So that much certainly is very and, much in our thoughts. And how has your experience been in terms of this online classes, ma'am? Is the engagement as deep as it used to be? The interaction, the engagement, uh, and the learning uh, in, in any sense? So uh, in terms of online classes, our experience has been very good. Uh, and the, you know, it was in no time at all, almost overnight, that the faculty agreed to change uh, immediately to online classes. And of course, Ashoka, we are very fortunate in having absolutely outstanding faculty. And in no time at all, they had adapted to online classes. So did the students. But of course, India being what it is, and with students away from campus in different cities of the country, and Ashoka, uh, like Kriya, values diversity. So our student body comes from a wide range of uh, towns and cities of India. So for some of them, internet connection has been a challenge. Uh, we've tried to help them in every possible way, uh, you know, uh, giving them resources. But even then, at the end of the day, it might not, not always work. So there's a small uh, percentage for whom it was very challenging. But for the others, it is amazing, you know, how engaged they have been. And only today I've been sitting in on the uh, fourth year presentations of the Department of English, their, uh, you know, thesis, uh, pro seminars. And everyone was there, and everyone is engaged. And in a sense, you know, because we are all separated, all far away, not on campus, these classes are the spaces where the bonding happens, where we all come together. And so these classes have been very su successful in terms of education, but also very successful in uh, bringing us together as a university community. So I think it's really worked very well. And, and one more thing, ma'am, uh, because you passed out a, a few batches, I'm asking you this question. While we talk of outcomes, ma'am, uh, there is uh, uh, a larger, uh, you know, persistence on the outcome being tangible, which is a placement or a career prospect or how students do after they pass out. One is higher education, but two is the placement process. Can you explain, uh, because a lot of questions that come to us is that, what is the tangible outcome or benefit that a student gets after he passes out of a liberal arts university you know, in terms of a BA, BSc, whatever it is? What is the tangible mm -hmm. outcome? So can you tell them, all the parents and students listening to you, of the way, I know that you, you're not promising a placement, so this is not about placements, but still in terms of the career support system that you have and how it plays out. So we have an office called the CDO, the Career Development Office which is very active and supports the student. And of course, when a uh, campus was open, we had many campus interviews where students would appear and they would be helped. Now that we are all away, we are still continuing our efforts of placement and uh, the support that we give to students is not only at the time of their graduation, but it continues beyond that. So we feel responsible for our students and we make sure that each and every student at Ashoka gets a placement. And of course, uh, because of the kind of people we have in our governing body, uh, you know, there is uh, such strength in our governing body 
that they are able to provide us with many kinds of openings uh, and leads as to where we can go, bring people to campus for these interviews or put us in touch with them. So with the support of the entire go governing body, with the entire team of founders and our board of trustees, which again has some of the biggest names you can think of. So with that entire corporate support, together with the academic support that our faculty can bring because of their own credentials, this combination of corporate support and academic support that the student has ensures for them a very bright future. And we are committed to ensuring that you know, they yeah. get a good placement. In terms of roles, ma'am, uh, uh, again, trying to elaborate on the placement because that is something that students look for. Uh, I'm not even asking for the companies. You can name the companies if you wish. But what kind of roles that do a liberal arts graduate get into once he passes out, he or she passes out? There was a time when um, people thought that from Ashoka, an economics graduate would get you know, uh, various kinds of great offers, also from computer sciences. But it's also amazing that even you know, IT, uh, the top IT companies are also very interested in our English and history graduates. You see, I think what they see in Ashoka is that the Ashoka product is a, someone, a student is someone who has had this holistic experience and as a human being is so well rounded out, has learned to think critically, is a good communicator. So these are skills that they are looking for. The rest they can provide through their own training. But the raw material that they get in the Ashoka student is something that even those uh, you know, uh, corporates uh, including banks, that we would earlier have thought perhaps out of reach for the humanities students or the social science, but certainly the humanities students, is no longer so. So it's, it is what matters to them who are hiring from Ashoka is the Ashoka product. What kind of student is emerging from this university? So we have seen these results and you know um, the data is there to show that even such companies, banks, etc., are very interested in every kind of Ashoka student. Uh, Dr. Ransom, this is for you. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, 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 arts programs that they do, uh, the normal pathway for a STEM college student is that he gets onto a job, right? right. Uh, there are places to open and they get onto a job. What is an ideal pathway for a student who graduates out of a uh, liberal arts university like this? So let me just pick it up from where uh, Dr. Sarkar left it. I think there's a little bit of a myth that, you know, that there's an easier pathway for, for a STEM student or an engineering student. In fact, my experience both teaching in the U.S., but I think I genuinely see this when I see the credentials of people who have done well in life and what their background was. But I do think something I say to my CREA students that, you know, over the course of the three years, I see the students' interests may change. They come in saying, I want to study biology, but by the end of their third year, they may have specialized in biology, but they may actually add history as a minor or whatever, because they develop a fascination with a, with a professor's set of courses, right? So I feel like the combination of our career advising and the academic advising, along with what the students' plan of study should prepare them for any number of maybe six to seven pathways, Mr. Perry. So one pathway could be they want to go and specialize and become an academic like Dr. Sarkar or I. That's a standard one. But I also think there could be very other interesting pathways and we should make that a reality for the students. So for instance, they may want to go and take the UPSC and change Indian government from within. I think a liberal arts student is actually very well positioned to do that. Or they may want to work for India Inc. Or they want to go and work for nonprofit sector or the social sector. Or they want to go and be an entrepreneur. I actually think that any number of those pathways is possible. And I think the experience of liberal arts universities in the West, but also just the way students are, that if the right set of courses get taken and they have the right set of experiences as either as an internship or as a project, 
and with the right mentoring and counseling, I think any of these pathways become open to any of these students. In fact, that's what I suspect would have been Ashoka's experience. And I'm very clear that that should be Priya's experience uh, as we start graduating the first batch in a couple of years. Because I think what the study at places like Ashoka and Kriya do, it teaches them how to think, how to write, how to communicate, how to ask questions, how to be critical uh, in terms of evaluating evidence, how to look around corners, how to make sense of data versus noise versus signal. I think those are the skills that any employer wants and also how to relate to people, right? If you have a very diverse class, you know how to relate to people. All of these so-called, I, I don't like the word soft skills because I think these are extremely yeah. hard, but how do I interact with a fellow human being is maybe one of the most challenging skills and competencies we want in any employee. So I agree that what places like Kriya are doing are preparing students for life. It so happens that you will have six or seven jobs or six or seven careers, and we will do everything to place you. But I think there are six or seven pathways and there should not be any one pathway that says a Kriya student should go and become that, uh, whatever that one pathway is. I think we want to be as open to any number of pathways because creativity is infinitely, uh, the potential is there in so many of our students. And I would love for a Kriya student to be an actor, to go and, you know, and of course certain things may not be. You want to be, you want to take on uh, Virat Kohli, maybe you should have started much younger. Uh, but my point is the average professions that we can send them into, I don't see there's any limit in terms of what we are preparing them for and what the student interest is and what the country needs. I think that matching will definitely happen. Uh, Dr. Sarkar, this is for you. Uh, I understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, that we can create pathways and I do understand because, uh, you know, the kind of quality of students that you uh, take and the way you, uh, the process that you have uh, and the kind of teaching that you have, you will definitely add a lot and lot of value of them. But the experience of a STEM college is that, you know, they immediately look for placements. You know, uh, you know, once they pass out, they're looking for placement, they're sitting for placements. What has been the experience of a liberal arts university like yourself? Because a few batches have graduated. Do they try to work for a couple of years and then go for higher education? Do they go for higher education? What is that decision? How is that decision happening? You see, um, there is diversity there as well. So there, there are a uh, bunch of students who wish to go for higher education. And they, many of them have thought of that all along and they haven't changed their mind and that's where they want to go and that's what they're preparing themselves for. For the others, there again, for some, it is an economic necessity to get a job because of family circumstances. So they will be looking for jobs. But what matters is that as they go into their jobs, because you know they have to support their families, they are also, I mean, they themselves are a, uh, in a way uh, a different person because the university, a great university is always transformational. What it does is it brings out, you know, what is uh, the potential, the best potential in a person. So they would go into jobs, they would need to earn money, but they would be great at uh, you know, uh, also at making the lives of others around them in their workplace different. They would carry their experience with them and make an impact on those they are, you know, who are there around them. There are others uh, who maybe have always aspired towards certain kinds of careers and, you know, um, uh, jobs and placements and will be taking that forward. So it's a variety. There are some who need the job for financial reasons, some who think that this is where they're going to make a mark in this kind of job, so that's where they want to go. There are some who wish to go in for higher at, you know, academics, and that is what they're focused on. So there is a wide variety of what we get at the end of the third year. And, you know, this has been happening since 2017 when we graduated our first batch. Dr. Ramakrishna, this question goes to you. Uh, you taught in liberal arts college in US, right? Uh, a lot of students within India, they think that if they want to pursue liberal arts, it must be not in India, but outside of India. Till possibly Ashoka came in, right? right. Otherwise, the concept of liberal arts universities wasn't there at all. Uh, Ashoka spirited, then flame, and many of you joined, right? 
can you tell a student who wants to do liberal arts of why they can consider india and it's not necessarily only abroad that you have the best of liberal arts education so you know it's it's a very good question i think it's also we have to remember that some of these institutions that you're uh, that you're talking about in other parts of the world especially the us are hundreds of years old so they have a huge uh, lead in some ways but this is a question that comes up every time i go traveling around the country to talk about priya and why liberal arts in india yeah. i think it's the time has come and i appreciate the names of the institutions you're mentioning including the one we have right now at the shoka having started this but also flame before that and then gentle and so on and i remember in one of the meetings we had uh, you know i jokingly said india needs about 50 or 60 of this <coughs> right now we have about five or six you know for the size of the population we can have one in every single state and we will still not be done because i think the system of education you know what's amazing as an economist i see so much change in india since the 91 reforms i feel like why has education not produced that kind of change it's only the last 5 7 years that you see the change and i think the time has come so i think you know students used to automatically think if they had to do something that was not pure engineering or medicine or law they have to go abroad now there are options and i think the other thing putting on my economist hat quite frankly is that it's one fifth or one seventh the cost given the exchange rate with the dollar i mean think about what uh, ivy league education or the little ivy league education costs compared to what even an ashoka or a kriya i think it's an incredible uh, value for money but of course you have to we have to prove ourselves because some of these institutions have been around for 200 years and will will use that example that, that they have been around but remember what how much you have to pay to get that so i am actually very happy that india is producing these opportunities for parents to keep their undergraduate children closer to home um and make them study here and then maybe think about going abroad for graduate school which is what i did but i was always quite amazed when i became an international student advisor of my institution and i saw these 17 year olds and i've been made lifelong friendships with them but i think many of them came to the us in the 90s and the 2000s because they had no other option now it's all about creating optionality and the fact that there are choices not just because of covid but there are choices for parents to think whether i should send them to an ashoka whether i should send them to kriya whether i should send them to flame or i mean that is a remarkable change in the last 10 years and i wish there were many more such institutions to create that change so that higher education in india finally comes into the 21st century dr sarkar this is for you and i'll re also read out the kind of programs that you offer so that there is a clarity in all the people who are listening to this program of what a liberal arts universities you know varied courses can offer you actually have bio biology bsc honors chemistry bsc honors computer science bsc honors economics bsc honors english ba honors history mathematics bsc honors philosophy ba honors physics bsc honors political science ba honors psychology ba honors and sociology anthropology as ba honors and i have also noticed similar kinds of courses on kriya also now can you tell the student out there how does a liberal arts university deal with the honors part of it in the sense ki what is it that makes the, uh, the normal bsc to be bsc honors how uh, in your question is how does a let's say a ba in english uh, at ashoka differ from a ba in english exactly. at another university and it's the exactly. same sort of question with let's say you know biology uh, yeah, here yeah. and and so yeah but there are two things essentially that is different one is that while the student is uh, majoring or doing an honors uh, as it's called elsewhere in a particular discipline and learning the uh, the core uh, parts of that discipline at the same time that student is also uh, uh, experiencing our foundation courses having the option to take courses minor courses or concentrations in other areas so there is this kind of cross fertilization that's happening that is one difference because that is something other universities the state uh, universities the central universities are not able to offer because the regulations don't permit it so that is something that uh, university like ashoka or kriya can offer so it's that range of you know uh, interest that can be pursued while 
uh, working in, within a particular discipline. That's one. Secondly, at Ashoka, uh, our teaching is also permeated with research. So students at the graduate level is encouraged to think about research and to integrate you know, research uh, uh, methods into what they are working on. Uh, undergraduate students have actually published papers you know, jointly with faculty in some top research journals. So this, um, and this research mindset is not only for academics, it's for any pathway you take in life because it, in, it uh, makes you someone who can think. And so it in, it's in uh, enabling that, that Ashoka does, which um, the other universities are not able to do because of regulations and in uh, being able to integrate many other pathways uh, while following one major discipline, which again, other universities are not able to follow. That uh, you know, makes the Ashoka experience quite different. Uh, sir, uh, this is for you. Uh, you actually have a school of interwoven arts and sciences. Uh, I know that you explained right. about this a bit earlier. Can you slightly elaborate on that? And this is the last question to you before I come for the closing comments. So, Korea has two grad. Uh, there's a graduate school of business which offers the MBA and a PhD in right. business and economics. That's the IFMR part, isn't it? Finance. That's the IFMR and, then, part. and then there's the, but that's part of Korea now. And then there is that's a school right. of interwoven arts and sciences which is the uh, offers the undergraduate. Uh, Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science. And the idea of the interwovenness comes in um, because as I've, as I've said before, uh, Perry, the, beyond the core and the skills or the foundational courses in the first year, when students are studying a discipline, we felt that there were six or seven or eight very key ideas that students have to be exposed to in different contexts again and again in order for them to sort of uh, become better at a particular discipline. Let me take my own discipline of economics, right? I think I'm a better economist if I also can study mathematics, philosophy, politics, and even maybe physics, right? So instead of studying all my subjects only in economics, if I can study papers that are also related to my discipline, I actually become a better economist. And I'm sure the same thing can be said for a student of history or biology or faculty uh, uh, or the faculty in those areas will have to be able to uh, interact and be able to advise students to do that. So the idea of interwoven was these key concepts, whether it's a sense of history of ideas, whether it's ideas of doing research in a discipline, or given that we live in such a world of data, I actually say that data is very much like a language, like learning Hindi or Mandarin or Spanish, it's like learning data. So, you know, these, 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 these threads get woven in again and again. I use the example of ethics previously, but it could be data too. It could be a sense of history. It could be a sense of uh, research in a discipline. So the fact that you don't just see it once and drop it and go on to something else, you sort of stitch this together and bring it back in your second year, bring it back in your third year, and then finally it all culminates because every single student at CREA has to do a capstone thesis. It doesn't matter if you're the brightest student or the most top scoring student or you're somebody who's, who just likes to do research but may not have done as well grades wise. I feel like everyone should do research. And so this idea of undergraduates doing research and faculty mentoring them is another one of those key interwoven principles. And so I think that brings a sort of a totality to the curriculum of when they start as a first year student and they finish three years, it sort of comes together in a very amplified way that it reinforces all the classes coming together and finally it's sort of pinnacle with their capstone thesis so that it prepares them for whether they, as I said, go on to graduate school or they go on to work in some other walk of life. So the interwoven is imagining uh, a threading or, or a tapestry. The thread still maintains an identity, but it's a, it's a grouping of threads that come together that creates a tapestry and that's really the way a career curriculum is envisioned. Just a supplementary question to that, sir. Uh, 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 you talked of capstone. So can you, for the students out yeah. there, talk of the internship, the externship, uh, the capstone project, the research, 
those kind of things which actually add a lot of value to the education that you guys oh absolutely absolutely so one of the core values of kriya is what we call porous boundaries between the real world and the academic world right so i have really long believed that the academic world should not be some ivory tower as as a cliche goes that we sort of cocoon the students and then you never expose them in fact i would like the academic world and the real world to have porous boundaries so the real world keeps coming into the academic world this takes multiple formats uh, you have professors of practice who bring their practicing craft into the classroom you also have students going out into the real world either as internships or externships as projects which are required in the between the first year and the second year between the second year and the third year so they are constantly exploring different avenues do i want to be a journalist do i want to be a non profit sector actor or do i want to go and work in a bank so there are different ways in which the real world constantly interacts with the academic world in a kriya setting and so that the student doesn't quite say that college is all about what i study in the classroom and then i'll go and worry about the job later we actually want the careers and demystify the idea of a job or a career so that the idea of placement is not a stressful thing you do only in the third year it's something you start thinking about between your first year and second year between your second year and third year so these kinds of experiences projects internship expunge externship going abroad to do a project all of this builds up your portfolio so that when you're ready to leave kriya you now not only have 35 classes you have taken but you also have all these other experiences that you've done either on campus or outside of campus and some of these you may look back and say i really don't want to go into the line of work or you may actually look back and say that is the kind of line of work i really want to go into and i'm so thankful i got to do that in those 3 years because now i want to study that for or do that for the rest of my life so i think those are as critical for us as what happens inside the classroom dr malvika this is the last question for you a lot of parents are always confused in terms of uh, uh, and i tell the st students and parents when they come to me because i'm a counselor and i always tell them that listen a liberal arts university gives you the flexibility uh, with Uh, to choose what you want to do as you keep moving up your education level uh, unlike uh, a stem university which says that okay you're doing computers you're doing computers period and four years you persist with that whether you like it or don't like it so uh, can you uh, advise the students and parents out there of the kind of flexibility that a liberal arts university gives students so that they can at even at a later date start dealing with what their interest levels are and, ch and changing the, uh, the the pathways Yes, so Ashoka offers this opportunity that in the first year, in the two semesters of the first year, the student basically does the foundation courses, and then in the second year, starts having experience of some of the gateway courses of the various majors, uh, you know, whatever takes their fancy. So they can try one, give that up, try another one, come back to the first one, or maybe stay with the second one, or experiment with the third one. they can choose a major and then they can change from that as well so we have a, a great deal of flexibility built into our system as long as they do the number of credits that are required for a major which they can but within that there is a huge amount of flexibility in choice so no one is siloed into any one uh, area as happens at other universities Uh, you know the uh, uh, traditional ones but one you know here people have a choice and they can um, change later as well and along the way they can pick up um, their interests in areas that they felt perhaps I should have done that by making that into a minor or even doing a concentration so a major is 12 courses a minor is six courses a concentration is four courses so while doing the 12 courses of major is someone let's say in um uh history someone may then think that i should have done psychology so picks up a concentration of four courses in psychology to add to the major so this is the kind of you know incremental uh, work that they can do which gives them a, a huge amount of options a uh, possibilities and you know uh, different kinds of experiences and they can then perhaps later on in life go on in to move in those various directions so there is a, a kind of flexibility that's built in here uh, yeah 
so 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 would you say that a student who has taken bsc physics can at later point make it bsc mathematics but in uh, as you know in some of the science uh, subjects it is um, mathematics is uh, you know one of the foundational things that one has to do so if you graduate with a bsc in physics yes you graduate with a bsc in physics but in your fourth year if you want to do mathematics okay, okay. that yeah. that is certainly a possibility okay, okay. yeah i and think in, 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 yeah please please no i just I'm just saying that i enjoyed hearing um about kriya's uh, you know interwovenness because that's so much a part of the shoka logo as well as you can see you know on the website it that you know that is something we have all, always believed in and you can see the circularity of our interwoven logo you cannot take apart any of those strands and it all holds together no in fact i must tell you ma'am when i called the two of you together i was very clear about one thing in my head that you people don't compete with each other you complement each other no. you add value to each other and which is the reason otherwise two universities sitting together is always these days it become more competitive especially in the stem side of it so one of the reasons why i call you is because uh, i at when i students talk to me it's always a big challenge to tell a student that listen you need to keep your options open uh, and and it's we are pushing him too early in his life to decide what he wants to be <laughs> which is very very unfair to the student i have suffered that many people would suffer that so the entire objective is to you know create that uh, you know route to him which says that listen you still have options open as you move along and uh, uh, dr uh, uh, ramsamy closing comments from you of what you would tell the parent and the student out there who is listening i think i think uh, what i would tell the parent is uh, listen to your child the world is very different than when i was a child in some ways or when they were uh, children i think students are much savvier today uh, there's also a lot of stress i think uh, i think the world is very different i think every generation feels it i think uh, uh, to your earlier comment i think place like kriya and ashok uh, i think we are creating an ecosystem that is creates an alternative for uh, outlet for the students who don't want to feel stymied or siloed at 17 Uh, i think they want to explore and and the fact that india is now creating those options uh, i think it's all about excellence i think uh, we don't want to compromise on that i think uh, we want to create a platform of diversity and i think the parents should explore check us out i i always say there is nothing called the best college it's what's best for you and for some students ashoka might be very good for some it might be kriya for some it might be delhi university but you need to explore and the fact that there are choices now i think is a really good thing compared to uh, say 20 30 years ago or even 15 years ago and i think the places like ours are creating a standard of excellence that india should be very proud of and of course we ourselves have to hold ourselves up so it's not empty words and rhetoric i think we have to do a lot to build and earn that level of trust but i think if you have to look at what the classical tradition of liberal education has been some of the greatest minds uh in the world in any field have come with that sort of background and i think that should give confidence to our indian parents that if their kids are entrusted in educational institutions that produce that level of diversity and excellence their children will rise to great strengths Doctor uh, Sarkar, your closing comments, ma'am. I just like to add uh, to this uh, the, to the parents that those of you who look at the IITs, um, you know, as great places. Of course, they are great places. But I'd also like you to notice that the IITs and ISERs are also introducing humanities and social sciences into you know their curriculum. So liberal arts and sciences or liberal arts is here to stay. it this is the future for india and i would tell the parents not to hesitate but to have courage be sincere look at what universities like ashoka and kriya have to offer and let the young people make their choice you know today with the way the internet has transformed our lives the world is you know at the click of a mouse so it's very easy for anyone to check out what the world scenario is like how india is faring historically indian uh, education higher education 
grew up in a particular way. Then there came a time when you know, research uh, was separated from teaching. The institutes were created. Universities were left behind only to do teaching, no research. All of that is history. Now things have moved. Of course, our top uh, public universities are also very good, but they are not able to provide the kind of liberal education that universities like Ashoka and Kriya can. And the products that will step out of these new universities will be the kind of people who will be citizens of the world. So I think, you know, parents should invest and think, you know, um, be brave, think of us, look and see what we do, analyze what we do, make their own decisions, but not think that these are newfangled places, but think that this is the future for India. And there'll be many more Ashokas and many more Kriyas in the yeah. years going forward. In fact, I met one of the supporters of Ashoka some time back, and his only wish was that he's allowed to create one Ashoka in every state of this country. So, uh, uh, just to say, and this Dr. Ramasamy also alluded to that somewhere uh, in this conversation. And I do think that there is a space for about four or five such liberal arts universities in each state in the country because uh, you need to expand that, uh, uh, that. Otherwise, we would not have a broader horizon. We'll only be very narrow in our thinking. So, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ramasamy and Dr. Sarkar, for joining me. It's a pleasure. And we'll have the transcript and the video version of it within the next two days across the platforms. Uh, and hopefully, students will keep uh, looking at this whenever they take a decision on liberal arts. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. It was Thank a pleasure. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.